Over the next few days, we're going to talk about air quality and air pollution. And it's actually one of the bright spots of being home right now doing this is right next to me, not at the moment, but sometimes, um, my husband actually works in the air quality and um, air pollution mitigation industry. He works for the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, which we're going to talk about as we're talking about this. So if during the course of this, if you have any questions, if you want to dig deeper and know more about specifics with different industries or about how they monitor for air quality, please, please put in the comments your questions and I'll ask him and maybe I can convince him to get on the webcam one of these times and um, talk to you guys about what he does and, and how he does it and why. So we're going to start today with just real basic, real simple, what is air pollution, where does it come from, and then we'll talk more the next time about how it affects us. So air quality, or sorry, air pollution can come from a variety of different sources. Some of them could be man-made, definitely, and we'll talk at great length about that, but it's important to remember that some air pollution, some harmful air substances in the air can be natural. Um, natural sources of air pollution could be a volcanic eruption, which releases sulfur dioxide into the air. It could be dust or pollen, what we're experiencing right now. Um, pollution is a very general term for any time that you have a substance built up to an unhealthy level. So pollution doesn't necessarily just have to have a big you know, company that needs to be fined and taken to court and stuff. No, it could just be something else that has built up to an unsafe level. So just keep that in mind that it doesn't necessarily have to be industrial. It could be something completely natural. So when we talk about um, sources of pollutants, there are primary sources and there are secondary sources. Now, primary pollutants are pollutants from the time they're released. They're put directly into the air, either by human activity or again from natural sources. I need to change that down here. They're put directly into the air as a pollutant. So our little um, diagram down here gives you a couple of primary sources, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, they're going to count as one, sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, um, and then like your hydrocarbons, if you have a gasoline engine and it doesn't completely combust all the way, then those leftover hydrocarbons would come into the air and little particles and dust. They're pollutants straight from the tailpipe or straight from the smokestack or straight from the volcano. You don't have to do anything to change them into a pollutant. Um, here are some primary air pollutants. These are some that we look at and that we monitor to see about the health of our air and the quality of our air. Um, so you may stop the video right now and kind of give yourself a table of what those pollutants are, um, describe them, where they come from, and then what effects they could have on human health. Okay, if you're ready to go on, now that you've pressed pause and made yourself a little table, we're going to talk a little bit about secondary pollutants. Now, secondary pollutants aren't pollutants until they are created from the reaction of other primary pollutants. So our best example is ground level ozone. And when Tyler is out of air quality compliance, it's usually ozone related because of how much traffic we have in town. So ground level ozone is formed when ultraviolet rays from the sunlight causes nitrous oxide and VOCs to react and react with the atmospheric oxygen, the O2, to create um, ozone molecules, which are O3. And I put a little link to a video in here. Um, if you want to pause and watch it now, you can. If you want to watch it after this video, you can. But there's a little video on there that explains very briefly what that chemical reaction is and how that takes place, um, how those VOCs and NO2 react to form um, ozone. Really, as far as like testing goes, I don't think you're going to have any big, long chemical formulas that describe this process. The main thing to know is the uh, reactants, which is the nitrous oxide, the NO2, and the VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds or hydrocarbons. They have carbon and they have hydrogen, um, like gasoline would be a hydrocarbon. And then um, atmospheric oxygen, and then you get ozone out of it. And there's other things that it produces, but again, you're going really deep into this. It's actually um, complicated, but just look at what is emitted and then what is produced. And that um, ultraviolet rays are the driver of this process. So 
when we get a bunch of ozone and of course the other products um, of this reaction that's released, then we could get this thing called photochemical smog. And if you've ever looked at pictures of Los Angeles, California, or um, other very large cities where they have kind of that haze or that smog over the city, that's that photochemical smog um, that forms with that nitrogen oxide and the VOCs with the heat and the sunlight and it produces that ozone as well as some other pollutants along with it. Um, not only can it create that haze and, ir and um, make a, a, a big fog, like reduce visibility, but it can also be a lung irritant. So our enforcement agencies, whether it's EPA or state, they will identify what they call ozone action days. And these are days you usually see them during the summer because that's when the ultraviolet rays are most directly um, over us because of the sun's rays being over us. Um, those ozone action days are days when our air quality could get unhealthy. And so we take um, steps to prevent um, a buildup of ozone in our atmosphere. So they might tell you things like um, using your lawnmower or driving in the morning or in the evening when the ultraviolet radiation is not so directly overhead. And if you're irritated by ozone, if you have asthma or if you're another, you know, sensitive group like that, they might tell you not to um, run outside, not to exert yourself or play soccer outside during the middle of the day when the ozone is highest because it can irritate you. So we want to either reduce those VOCs like a lawnmower or driving your car would emit, um, and then also to, to prevent those VOCs and the nitrous oxide from getting into the air and reacting and causing that ozone. And then on those days where they're predicting that the ozone will be bad, you want to um, reduce your time outside. So we've talked a little bit about vehicle emissions. Vehicle emissions um, create almost a third of the air pollution that, that we experience. Um, gasoline and other diesel that come out of the backs of cars um, create several pollutants and, and put them into our atmosphere. So nitrogen oxides, we talked a bit about, about that. They can lead to ozone formation as well as acid rain, which we will cover. Um, carbon monoxide, um, if you've ever you know, seen in movies people murdering someone by putting them in the car and shutting the garage door and leaving the car running. That buildup of carbon monoxide is what's killing them. It's kind of a morbid thing, but I just always think of those movies where that happens and then no one knows what happened. Anyway, um, sulfur dioxide comes from diesel. There's a lot more sulfur in diesel than there's in gasoline. Of course, the hydrocarbons, the unspent gasoline itself, and then particles, smoke, smog, you know, the, the particles that are emitted. So the um, environmental agencies decided in the 1970s that they needed a way to control this, this air, to, to clean up the air because it was getting pretty bad. So in 1970, they enacted the Clean Air Act. And then in 1990, of course, they revised it as they do often. But this gives the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, the authority to regulate emissions. Um, they are the agency that called for unleaded gasoline. They removed the lead from gasoline because lead is a pollutant that was getting into the air and causing a bunch of, of health problems. So now we have unleaded gasoline um, and also called for the use of catalytic converters on automobiles. So there's a diagram over here um, of a catalytic converter and how it works, but I've also included a video linked underneath. It's very short of what a catalytic converter looks like and how it causes a reaction to clean up the things that are coming out the end of the tailpipe. Without it, a lot of those emissions would go straight out and into the air, but the catalytic converter really cleans up and causes a reaction to make the things that come out of the tailpipe less harmful um, than they otherwise would be. So watch that video. If you want to pause now and go to it, you can, and then jump back in, or if you want to watch the videos after this, totally fine. All right, so we'll move on to industrial sources of pollution. Um, one of the big ones, not the big one, but one of the big ones is the combustion of coal from um, burning coal to create electricity. We talked a little bit about coal and um, other fossil fuel burning power plants and how they're still readily available. Um, the fossil fuels are very cheap. They're very easy to use. You can put them anywhere. You don't have to 
depend on the weather. So there is still a lot of coal and other fossil fuels being used to generate electricity. The problem with that is, of course, the release of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, because there's a lot of sulfur in coal, um, some toxic metals like mercury and lead that can be emitted, and then, of course, the particles like ash. Now, of course, you can't just emit all you want. There has to be a way to clean up the things that are being released. So we have a couple of um, different devices, depending on what your industrial process is. A scrubber will remove pollutants, and I'm sorry the, the um, picture got covered up by my picture over here. Um, let me move myself. Can I move myself? No, I can't. All right, there we go. The um, scrubber will remove gases by dissolving them in water. So the water sprays, the gas is coming through the scrubber, and the water will remove those pollutants, and, and then they'll be taken, and, and the water will be treated like you would at a, at a water treatment plant. And then an electrostatic precipitator um, uses static to attract um, particles like ash to the sides, and then they're collected and removed. So industrial processes have to have ways to clean up the gases before they emit them into the atmosphere. Um, self back right there. All right, um, one way or one time that we could get worse air quality than normal is if we have a temperature inversion. Normally, air will circulate, it will rise, it will blow with the wind, um, and, and so your air pollution doesn't get concentrated in one place, it gets kind of well mixed in the atmosphere and dissipated. But if we have a temperature inversion, to invert means to flip, right? So instead of the air getting progressively cooler as it rises, you've got a warm layer on top of a cold layer. And so when your smoke or your smog or emissions are rising up, they get trapped by that warm layer and stay closer to the city. Um, when we talk about environmental disasters, we're going to talk about the London smog of 1952. If you're super into that stuff, you can go and look it up. But we're going to talk about that when we talk about natural disasters. But this is one thing that led to that disaster is all of the coal um, emissions in 1952 from, from burning and creating electricity, instead of rising and being dissipated into the countryside, was trapped there um, into the city and, and caused a, a, lot of, a lot of death, um, a lot of problems there. So temperature inversions could be a problem that could cause air pollution to be worse in one area than, than normal. Um, all right, so we're going to stop there for today. I double clicked. We're going to stop there for today and we will talk about health effects um, as well as other types of pollutants when we do part two, um, either tomorrow or the next day. And I'll, I will keep sending you information about that. I hope this was beneficial. Um, if you have any questions, again, for me or for my husband who works in this all the time, um, drop us a comment and we will address those on a future video or just type back to you. Either way, hope y'all are doing well. Keep me informed. See y'all soon.